while we're taping. I wish I was in church with all of you, men and women, boys and girls, our church family, and uh, hopefully it'll be soon. Sandy keeps track of what's going on, and uh, she will let me know as soon as we can uh, open the church up, and we'll let everybody know. She, of course, will let everybody know as, as uh, uh, the situation works. I wanted to focus on our youth this week. A very familiar uh, Bible study on prayer, but I want the youth to know that uh, you're, you're wanted, you're loved, the church hasn't forgotten you, and I haven't forgotten you. I found this gem that I want to share with you from uh, a Bible study or a Sabbath school lesson, The Wonder of Jesus, from June 2008. And I want to share this with you as we begin our Bible study. For the children. As the children gathered the wildflowers growing so abundantly around them, and crowded up to present to him their little offerings, he, we're talking about Jesus, received them gladly, smiled upon them, and expressed his joy at seeing so many varieties of flowers. These children were his heritage. He knew that he had come to ransom them from the enemy by dying on the cross of Calvary. He spoke words to them that ever after they carried in their hearts. They were delighted to think that he appreciated their gifts and spoke so lovingly to them. Christ watched children at their play and often expressed his approval when they gained an innocent victory over something they were determined to do. He sang to children in sweet and blessed words. They knew that he loved them. He never frowned on them. He shared their child, childish joys and sorrows. Often he would gather flowers and after pointing out their beauties to the children would leave them with them as a gift. He had made the flowers and he delighted to point out their beauties. And I found this. It has been said that Jesus never smiled. This is not correct. A child in its innocence and purity called forth from his lips joyous song. And that's taken from the Upward Look, page 57. I thought I'd share that with you. Our prayer requests go out to uh, Janet, uh, to uh, Ken and Sylvia. We want to pray for our youth. We want to pray for our parents. School has started, I understand. It's online, and I know it's not easy. And so I want to keep uh, those uh, that are dealing with school in uh, prayer. And JJ, make sure you do your homework before you play video. We're watching you. We're watching you. And uh, I want to just have you keep the church family in prayer. And uh, for those unspoken requests, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you so much that we have an ability to at least be able to continue to study your word. We uh, aren't together, but we are together in spirit. We pray that uh, you will uh, continue to open our minds and hearts to your leading. Help us to embrace you on a daily basis through our prayer, through our Bible study, time alone with you, and I pray that we will continue to learn more about your love that you have for us. I ask that you be with our prayer requests, as uh, there are many unspoken requests that you know about. I ask that you'll touch those issues, touch those people with whatever needs to be done. You do take care of us, uh, both physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, and I pray that all those requests will be answered and people will understand and know what those answers are as they listen to you and they learn from you. I pray that you'll be with Janet, help her with her pain, so that you can show her that uh, you can be the great physician for her. I pray that she can get a Sabbath day's rest. I ask that you be with Ken as he continues his healing, as you touch him in a special way, be with Sylvia as well as she cares for him. May they also have a Sabbath day's rest. I ask that you pray for the youth. I ask that we pray for the youth and that you touch them as they continue their school. May they know that they're not alone, 
they can turn to you and you can help them to remember what they need to learn, need to know. Be with the parents as well. It's got to be a trying time and I pray that they can realize that you're in charge and they can depend on you for everything. Be with our church family as we continue to grow in you, as we continue to minister to others in a new and different type of way, but you're still with us and we will continue to learn to grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. As again, I pointed out, our uh, Sabbath this morning is going to be directed more to our youth, uh, but us big people, we can still, we can still learn something. And we're going to talk about prayer. And again, I know Sandy's talked about it. It's been talked about before. But all of our young people, you need to, to realize that prayer can make a difference. We have been a praying church, and we have seen results. I'm a good example of that. And I know that there are others in the church that are examples of that. And I can't stress it enough, especially now that you're back in school. Realize that prayer can make a difference in your studies, it can make a difference in your daily life with your uh, brothers and sisters, your parents, your friends, and it does make a difference. Sometimes, as I, as I begin, our prayers are filled more with doubt than with confidence, and we know that for God to answer our requests, our prayers uh, have to be in line with His will. That, that we've, we've learned, we've touched on that. However, wondering if we are praying according to His will can trip us up, confuse us, and faced with the uncertainty, we stop praying. We fall silent. God's will is for each of us to have a healthy relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that means knowing the Father with increasing intimacy, progressing, uh, progressively becoming more and more like Him like Jesus. That's, that's what we want to be doing. And by focusing our prayers on having this type of relationship with the Lord, it becomes easier to know what to pray. And simply find a scripture that tells you something about God's character and pray that for others and for yourself. And the results can be this. You can pray with confidence because God wants all of us, His children, to be like Jesus Christ. You can pray expectantly because you know His will and He will work out His will in our lives. You can cooperate with the Holy Spirit while He works to develop the same quality in you. You gotta remember that prayer is not a game. It's not a game of I spy where we have to guess when to talk to the Lord or about what we want to talk about. Scripture is full of God's attributes and his desire for our lives. And pick one. Start praying. Watch what God does in response. Because prayer gains access to the spirit, to the hardened heart, to the unbelieving mind. There are no walls too high or thick for him to climb over to breach. So pray God's will and watch lives change, especially your own. Prayer does create change, and that's what we need to remember. Now, this morning, there's really no need to, to dwell on the feelings of the fear, of the anger, of the division, the uncertainty that's enveloped our nation during the last few months, and pessimism about the impact of the pandemic that's been going on that we know about. It's almost as bad as the pandemic itself. What we must not forget is that we're not powerless. All of us need to understand that. We're not powerless. Our voices are heard in heaven. Our voices are heard in heaven. And we can and we need to lift our voices in prayer. We need to ask God to intervene and to give us guidance for the ways that we can respond to these feelings with the love of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, the Apostle Paul is praying for the Christians in Ephesus. He's also praying for us and for all of those who are down through the ages who've come to know Jesus as the Savior and Lord. And Paul, he's, as he's praying, he says, 
For this reason, I kneel before the Father. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart. A lot of my ideas come from Pastor Newland and the Spirit of Prophecy this morning, by the way. And Paul continues in Ephesians, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints. Listen to that again. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He continues, Now to him who is able to do immensely more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, sometimes our prayers seem to be more urgent, don't they? they? Seem to be more urgent when we're in the midst of difficulties, especially now, struggling to understand and overcome the problems that weigh heavily upon us. And it can be as simple as, how do I deal with this test? Or it can be as difficult as, what do I do because I don't have a job? I understand all of that. And I want you to understand, God does as well. And if that's true, then we should be a praying people. We should be a praying people, praying church, earnestly beseeching God for His help in times like this. Now, I get this, I don't feel like praying. I don't want to pray. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Well, someone once said that. I don't feel like praying. And his friend answered, well, why don't you talk to God about it? Think about that. Prayer is simply talking to God, like you talk to your brothers and sisters, like to talk to your parents, like you talk to your friends. If you're struggling with your prayer life, I want to assure you that God is still a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. You don't have to pray in any specific way, using holy words, repeating religious phrases. You don't have to pray in any specific place. Any place you spend time with the Lord is holy ground, I would like to suggest, because that's just how it works, especially when you're talking to God. You don't need to pray a long prayer. The Lord's Prayer, it's short. Pray that, if nothing else. You don't have to pray a flowery prayer. Just speak from the heart speak from the heart. The important thing is that you take time to pray. And we're certainly living at a time of prayer. And one of the highlights of worship when we're at church together is prayer time. Whether it's anyone that's on the platform praying a prayer, it makes a difference. And I'm usually touched and it makes a difference for me. I miss that and I hope we can have that back again soon. There was a play, Love and Death. Napoleon, he walks by his lady's room and he heard voices. Suspicious of her faithfulness to him, he questioned her about it. This is a play. I was praying, she explained, but I heard two voices, Napoleon said, and she replied, I do both parts. I thought that was interesting. The reason we pray is not because we believe in the power of pray, prayer. We pray because we believe in the power of God. I want you to understand that. There's a difference. You don't pray because we believe in the power of prayer. You believe in the power of God. And we believe that He's the all-powerful all God of the Bible who has not put His power on hold. Open your Bibles to Psalm 115, verse 3, and it declares this, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. God does whatever He pleases. He doesn't need our vote, and He doesn't wait for our veto. Keep that in mind, especially now, with we've got, what, 70 days before the next election? Yeah, 
Think about that. He doesn't need our vote. He doesn't wait for our veto. Even King Nebuchadnezzar, and I know Sessie's talked about this to all of you in your Sabbath school class uh, for your young people. King Nebuchadnezzar, he knew that the God of Israel had that kind of power. For he declared, Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? So if we're going to talk about prayer, the first thing we need to do is to realize the awesomeness of God. Remember that, the awesomeness of God. And some have been taught that the only reason to pray is to change ourselves. But that's not the emphasis of the Bible at all. The Bible teaches that prayer can make a difference in what God does and that prayer can also have an effect on our circumstances. So prayer can make a difference in what God does, I would suggest to you. Do you respond, for example, do you respond when your children make requests of you? For all of you parents, all you big people. You do, don't you? You do respond when kids make requests of you. So does God, I would suggest. So does God. He's the perfect parent, isn't he? He's the perfect parent as well as the powerful creator. And the Bible teaches that prayer can make a difference in what God does. Let me give you some examples. I've been reminiscing that with uh, a, a number of church members, social distancing, of course, but we've been having these discussions. And for, for instance, remember when God brought his people out of Egypt by those great miracles? Remember those miracles? Then after seeing the sea open up before them, the people, they traveled to Mount Sinai. This has always been an interesting story for me for me and was brought up by a church member this past week. Moses is up on the mount. What's Moses doing? He's having a relationship, a conversation with God face, well, not face to face, but up there at the mountain, and he's getting the Ten Commandments, isn't he? He's having a long talk with God. And what happens? The people get impatient. It didn't take long for them. They thought Moses had abandoned them, even though they knew what he was doing and he was up in the mountain and what was going on. So what do they do? They take off their jewelry, they melt it down, they pour the liquid gold into a mold shaped like a calf. And guess what they got? They get the golden calf. I know you young people have, t have studied that with Sessie and talked about that. What did they do? They worshipped that calf, sang hymns to that calf brought offerings, declared that the calf was the God who had brought them out of Egypt. Hmm, think about that. To say the least, God's not pleased. And he says to Moses, I have seen these people, and they are stiff-necked people. And then God gives Moses a command. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. And that's taken from Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. And even though God told Moses to leave him alone, what does Moses do? He immediately begins to beg God not to destroy his people. Deuteronomy 9, verse 18, tells us that he kept pleading with God to spare the people. In verse 19, Moses said, I feared the anger and the wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again, the Lord listened to me. So what happens? In Exodus 32, verse 14, it tells us the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. He had threatened. Isn't it? Isn't it? When you think about this, isn't it wonderful that God does listen to our prayers and that prayer can make a difference in what God does? I would suggest that to you. God listened to Moses and God changed his mind. There's another example that I share with you and I've, ta I've taken from uh, um, experiences uh, from Bible study in the past. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, he's always a familiar uh, person to think about uh, in my, in my uh, Bible study. God tells Hezekiah, through the prophet Isaiah to get his affairs in order because he was going to die. Hezekiah prays earnestly 
And before Isaiah got out of the palace courtyard, God told him to go back and tell Hezekiah, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. I will add 15 years to your life. 2 Kings 20, verses 5 and 6. That's an interesting, well, it was, a, it was an interesting one for me in my personal life, and I, I share that with you. Now, some people say that God never changes his mind, but listen to what God says about that. Let me share that with you. In Jeremiah 18, verses 7 and 8, God says, If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and will not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Hmm. While God will never change his goal, please understand where I'm coming from, the redemption of mankind. He will and can change some particulars in response to the prayers of his children. He has that right, and he has demonstrated that many times in the Bible. Now, another point. Prayer can have an effect on our circumstances. Not only can prayer affect God's actions, prayer can also have an effect on our circumstances because we're talking to the one who has all power. Yesterday, today, and forever. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, we read, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Remember, I talked about that last week. When God was going to fill a valley full of water without any rain or wind, the prophet Elisha was told, This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. 2 Kings 3. An angel who came directly from heaven to Mary brought this message, Nothing is impossible with God. Luke 1, verse 37. Jesus, who knows God the Father better than anyone, said, With God, with God all things are possible. Matthew 19, verse 26. If God, angels, prophets, and Jesus proclaim the awesome power of God, then we who are Christians ought to proclaim it too. The disciples once each asked each other about Jesus. Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Luke 8, verse 25. We people, we human beings, are the only part of creation that God has given the freedom to listen to his command and then decide whether to obey or not. You know that? Did you know that? That's the reason God could say to the Red Sea, open up, and the sea opened up. When Jesus commanded the fig tree to dry up, it did not have a committee meeting with other fig trees to decide what to do. Anytime God speaks to nature, nature has no option but to obey. Remember when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? What was the condition of the lions? They were hungry, weren't they? They were hungry, but God closed their mouths. Remember when Jonah was thrown overboard? The Bible says that God provided a great fish to swallow him. The fish didn't have any option but to obey. Jonah was in that fish for three days and three nights. What do you think he did when he was in there? I'm convinced every way he could try to get out, he did. But nothing worked. And Jonah finally realized that he was in a crisis. And what did he do? He started to pray. And I know Sessie's brought that story up as a Bible study to all of, to all of you in his class. So... Jonah, as soon as he finishes praying, Jonah 2, verse 10, the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah up onto the beach, and it did. I would suggest to you, prayer does have power to affect circumstances. But what about today? Does God really continue to hear our prayers and intervene in our lives? Hmm, I'm convinced he does. I'm convinced that he does. And many of our missionaries have observed God's intervention firsthand. I'll give you some uh, illustrations that I got from, again, from Pastor uh, Newland. A man or a missionary by the name of Ron Morris witnessed an example of God's intervention in Thailand. He's working with some villagers in northern Thailand. And that area was having the worst grasshopper plague that anyone could remember. 
This is a true story, missionary story, okay? Finally, the leader of the village where Ron Morris was says to Ron, you go back home and gather your Christians and pray for three weeks that the grasshoppers will leave the Christians' fields. If when you return in three weeks the grasshoppers have left the Christians' fields but are still in the non-Christians' fields, I will help you lead this whole village to worship your Jesus. That's quite a challenge. That's quite a challenge. So, with sincerity and earnestness, the Christians prayed. Three weeks later, Ron comes back to that village and he's devastated by what he sees. Listen up. It's obvious that the grasshoppers were still in the Christians' fields. In fact, there seemed to be more grasshoppers in those fields. But upon careful examination, they found that the grasshoppers in the Christians' fields were only eating the weeds. They were not touching the rice. While the grasshoppers in the non-Christian fields were eating the rice and not the weeds. It's a true story. And there were so many grasshoppers in the Christians' fields that the droppings they left fertilized the grounds so well that they had an abundant harvest of rice, enough to feed all the people there. That's an awesome story. That's an awesome story. There's another one. There's another story. There's a missionary by the name of Jim McElroy. And he tells about what happened in the Philippines when he was called into a village. There was an infant that was deathly ill. The child had not nursed for days, was turning gray. In other words, hadn't, hadn't eaten and was really sick. His eyes were rolled back. He appeared lifeless and apparently very close to death. Jim, the missionary Jim, turns to the Filipino preacher and says, I didn't know we were coming here for a medical reason. I brought no medicine. Did you? The Filipino preacher said, no. What do we do now? And Jim answered, let's pray. While they were praying fervently for God's help, the infant reached up touched one of those who was praying, and before they finished praying, the infant moved towards the mother's breast and began to nurse. True story. The following week was Easter week. Jim's preaching in a neighboring village in an outdoor assembly, and he saw coming over the brink of the hill a woman carrying a baby, and behind her were over 20 adults. And as they got closer, Jim recognized the mother and the infant who was looking very, very healthy. And the adults had come to accept Jesus Christ and to be immersed in baptism. Another powerful story. Now, young people, I don't want you to think that it does not mean God will always answer yes to our prayers. I want you to understand that. We all have experienced no answers. We all have experienced no answers. And we must be careful lest we start to believe that we can order God around with our prayers. That's not how prayer works. Our God listens carefully to our prayers and our agonies and our heartaches. Remember, His Son died on the cross. But He's not going to permit us to dictate to Him what He has to do. So. How do we understand it when we pray for someone to be healed and that person dies? I know that came up when we talk about Dale. I know that. Or we talk about some of your family members. I know that. It doesn't mean that God loves some more and some less. It doesn't mean that. Or that God respects some or not others. Open your Bibles to Psalm 103. 103. Verse 11, 103 verse 11, and it says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And with that great love, he also declares, 
My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I talked about that last week, taken from Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Recall, I talked about that at length last week. As a result of that, I believe we can trust in a God who is that big and has that much love for us. So when the answer does not come exactly the way we want or expect, what do we do? Our faith, our faith should hold hands with the faith of another Bible study that says he's given you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember what those three men thrown into the uh, furnace of fire declared? Remember what they said? And you take it from Daniel chapter 3. They said, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Hmm, think about that. Our trust in the power of God continues not because we always get our way, but because we believe in the way of God. Think about the difference. We believe in the way of God. To pray is to tap into God's power. Non-Christians do not believe that God still has power today. If Christians don't believe it, who's going to? Who will? Isn't it time for us to catch up with our forefathers and believe in, teach about, and pray to the God we read about in Ephesians 3, verse 20, at the beginning of this Bible study, where it says, Now to him who is able to do all we ask or imagine, we can imagine great things. Wouldn't a God who would accomplish all of them be a great God? But do you notice of that message that there are, between the words do and all, those, those ideas indicate that, that there's some things that are left out. Putting those words back in, here's what Paul wrote. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us. See the difference? To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Remember, that's different than what I said originally. Now in him who is able to do all we ask or imagine, there's all kinds of ideas that come from the true text. And that's the power of prayer. It's the power of God. It's tapping into Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can possibly ask or imagine. And I say to you, that's an amazing God. That's an amazing God, and it's a privilege. Remember, it's a privilege to be able to talk to Him and to know that He listens and answers our prayers. So, sometimes, sometimes, our prayers are filled more with doubt than, than with confidence. That's what I said at the beginning of our Bible study. And we know that for God to answer our requests, our prayers can be in line and should be in line with His will. Keep that, keep that in mind. But when we feel helpless, read Psalm, uh, read Psalm 50, by the way, because as an example as I close, in adventure movies we often see people trapped and helpless, and they're frantically looking for a way to escape. That's what happens in a lot of those movies that you guys watch, even in the videos that you guys like to play. I've seen what goes on. Real life, though, can sometimes feel that same way for us. And as we begin to look for a way out, our, our prayers become filled with requests for rescue. That's what happens. Physical healing, changed circumstances, additional provision. But did you ever consider that even more important than physical rescue is spiritual liberation? Again, go back to Ephesians. 
and look at chapter 6, verse 12. First and foremost, Jesus Christ delivered you from the power and penalty of sin. Remember that. And as your living Savior, He also knows your continued helplessness. He knows all about that. Your helplessness in the face of sinful habits and uncontrolled emotions and ungodly thoughts. And that happens to all of us. And He wants to free us. He wants to free you from these sins. So seek out His offer of spiritual rescue every day, whether or not a physical crisis looms over you. And follow that example of the psalmist who cried out to God for deliverance. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and you will uh, honor me. And start by admitting your helplessness to the Lord and to yourself. Confess your fears. Confess your unbelief, your self-reliance that you might detect in your life. Surrender all further attempts and change that you are done apart from the Heavenly Father. And turn your gaze towards Him. And think about His relationship with you, who He is, and what He desires. And let the Holy Spirit fill your spirit with the truth of God's Word. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. Read the Bible. Read God's Word. Meditate on it. Commit yourself to following His way. And then trust God. And wait on Him to change you from the inside out. A day will arrive, I promise, a day will arrive when the helpless feeling will leave to be replaced by the joy of being free. And when it does, give God the glory. Let's pray for each other. Let's ask God to wrap His loving arms around each one of us in our church family, in your personal family, with your brothers and sisters, with your mom and dad, with everybody else in your family as well. I miss you guys. And remember, we're in this together. We're going to be able to worship together soon.